I call this meeting of the Northeast Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The board will now adjourn into executive session pursuant to the following sections of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Texas Government Code, Section 551.071, private consultation with the board's attorney, 551.072, discussing purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property. 551.074, to discuss personnel or to hear complaints against personnel. And the time is 7.35. The board will now reconvene into open session. The time is 6.19. On behalf of the trustees, I would like to welcome you to this evening's meeting of the Northeast Independent School Board. This is a business meeting of the board held in public. We appreciate your attendance and request your respectful attention. We welcome your comments during the matters from the floor section of the agenda. If you signed up to address a specific action agenda item, you will be called at that time. Finally, I would like to remind you that it is the mission of Northeast to challenge and encourage <laughs> each student to achieve and demonstrate academic excellence, technical skills, and responsible citizenship. Item five, invocation and pledge of allegiance, A, Johnson High School. Mr. Comalander. I do. Good evening. President Grona, members of the board, Dr. Micah, executive staff and guests. Uh, it is without any doubt my pleasure to be able to introduce these two outstanding students from Claudia Taylor Lady Bird Johnson High School. Uh, when it comes time to make those decisions, that's probably the hardest thing we have as principals. Uh, as we look through almost 3,200 kids to find the two to come represent the rest of them here, and these two do. First of all, I'd like to introduce Miss Amina Rose, if you would stand. Amina is an 11th grade student at Johnson. Uh, she is highly involved in our clubs and business areas. She's a member of our key club, FBLA, our HOSA, our union club, She's a member of our student voice group that we built and also a member of our Jack and Jill of America. But not only as a member of those, she's in leadership roles. She's the vice president of our key club. She's editor for the Jack and Jill. She's historian of our HOSA group. And then more importantly, she's our chapter vice president of the Johnson FBLA group. And she's the area for vice president for the state of Texas in FBLA. Uh, and they have seven areas in the state of Texas, and she represents the South Texas group, including that she'll be going to Galveston here uh, Wednesday, correct, to uh, work with the other area leaders. And her desire is to run for president as a senior to lead the entire state of Texas, oh, wow. future business <laughs> leaders of America. So she does stay a little busy. Do you sleep? Uh, <laughs> so. On the other side, she was one of our students of the month in October. Uh, she, in her spare time, loves piano for the last nine years and can play. She's the middle sister of three girls. Uh, one oldest sister graduated at Johnson last year. And she is represented here with her parents, uh, Mr. and Miss Rose. We got Dakari and Natasha Rose, if y'all would stand. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. On the other side, we also have Millen Fernandez. Millen is highlights on our athletic side and academic side. He is a little tall. Uh, <laughs> not too many at Johnson make me feel a little short, but he'll be taller does. than me. Uh, he has been highly involved in, believe it or not, our tennis program. He's a four-year letterman. Uh, he gets makes you very nervous when he's at the net because he does cover it. He played in the regional semifinals last year in boys doubles in the individual competition. Uh, we're hoping to have a shot to go to the state this year. He played our number one singles and number one boys doubles this fall in team tennis where we took second in district and made it to the second round. Uh, he also competes at the super championship level in Texas tennis, which is at one of the highest levels. But on the other side, he is a straight AP student. Uh, he will be a summa cum laude graduate here in a few months as he finishes up this last semester uh, to find out our summa cum laude. 
been a member of our National Honor Society for the past two years and has been a distinguished student with four years in our fine arts with various art courses. So he stays very busy on the academic side. He's looking forward to making a decision here, hopefully in the next few months, where he's going to play tennis in college. And he's also a member of our student voice group and represented us uh, the other day, a couple weeks ago, when he came and visited with the two of you. He is represented here with his mom, Lisa Wyatt. So like I said, these two are two fine, fine students that we are very excited to have bring the invocation and the pledge. So uh, this time, Amina will be leading us in the invocation for the evening, and then Millen will lead us in the pledge to the American flag and the Texas flag. If everyone would please rise. Good evening. I would like to welcome board members, executive guests, and honored guests that are here with us tonight. I'm Amina Rose, a junior at Johnson High School, and today I would like to speak about the board. The board is compromised of Dr. Micah, our superintendent, Ms. Grona, our president, Mr. Hayes, our <coughs> vice president, Ms. Huey, our secretary, Ms. Winkley, Ms. Mr. Byer, and Ms. Williams, our trustees. These individuals together help make NEISD a better and more comparable um, sorry, district. This year, a new club was created by the board called Student Voices. This club allows students to connect with the board about issues that they feel passionate about and are concerned. This board also created Star Student of the Month, which I was for last month, <laughs> and all NEISD schools to recognize their spectacular students and what they accomplished. All of these things the board does make them a step closer to the ultimate goal, which is to help students reach their full potential. And with that, we are thankful for the board and all the things you do for us. I would like to also thank my principal, Mr. Gary Comalander, for giving me this opportunity to speak to the board today. Thank you and good night. Good evening. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. If y'all will come forward, we have some, some, some certificates and we'll take a picture, please. Item six, matters from executive session. A, personnel including but not limited to administrative appointments pursuant to government code section 551.074. One, possible action regarding routine personnel 
including but not limited to administrative appointments. Do I have a motion to approve as discussed in the executive session? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hosso. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Winkley. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. <laughs> Item two, possible action regarding proposed recommendation for termination of Chapter 21 probationary contract employee. Do I have a motion to um, propose the termination as discussed in executive session? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hosso. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Byer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. <laughs> Item three, introductions, <laughs> Dr. Micah. Thank you, Mrs. Grona. Mm -hmm. I am pleased tonight to introduce our new Director of Web Applications Development, Mr. Ricardo Flores. <laughs> Mr. Flores is joining the Northeast family as the Director of Web Applications Development for Management Information Services. Before joining Northeast ISD, he was the Evaluation and Accountability Specialist at Westlaco ISD. <clears throat> Mr. Flores was drawn to the education profession after being intrigued with how in-house built software interfaces with technology hardware and developed a passion for creating applications for users to make their jobs easier, accurate, and faster. He received a bachelor's degree in computer management technology in 2004 from St. Edwards University. Mr. Flores has 12 years in education. Welcome to Northeast, Mr. Flores. Yes, welcome. <clears throat> That concludes our introductions for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. B, possible action on the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property pursuant to government code section 551.072. No action. C, possible action regarding consultation with board's attorney pursuant to government code section 551.071. One pending and or possible litigation. No action. Um, do I have any veterans in the audience? If so, would you please stand? I just want to thank you all so much for your service, um, mm -hmm. for what you have done. Um, Tony and I, Mr. Hosso and I were at Bush this morning and Stu Guthrie said, um, freedom is not free. And then he started talking about everything, the many freedoms that we take for granted. And it really got you thinking about, you know, having dinner with your family or reading to your child at night. And, and you all gave all of that. You sacrificed that. Um, for us and so I just want to let you know how much we appreciate everything all your service that you've done And we just want to thank you publicly tonight <laughs> Item 7 recognitions a 2019 National Healthy School Award Colonial Hills Elementary School. Mr. Clary. Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Micah, executive staff and guests, Ms. Sharon Glosson, executive director for school nutrition, is at the podium to make this presentation. Great. Thank you. Good evening. I want to start by, by just giving you a glimpse into the significance of this award that we're going to be recognizing tonight. Um, Colonial Hills Elementary School has been designated as a gold level National Healthy School for the Alliance for Healthier Generation. And I know there are a lot of awards um, that this district has gained, but this is a prestigious achievement that acknowledges many facets of what it takes to make a healthy school. Schools that receive this award meet standards that are established in the Healthy Schools Program Assessment, which is a very, um, a very large document that they have to fill out and provide a documentation for each item. It includes serving healthier meals and snacks, getting students active more than is required, offering high quality health and physical education, and supporting staff wellness so that they will be healthy role models for the students. This year, 355 schools were named national healthy schools at some level, but only eight schools nationwide achieved a gold level designation. And so today, Northeast ISD recognizes those individuals at Colonial Hills Elementary who helped earn the prestigious gold award. And so I would like for you to come up as I call you. Of course, it wouldn't have happened without principal, Janae Mai. 
from Colonial Hills. Also, we have PE coach and campus sponsor, Terry Pitts. We have several teachers that helped place, um, helped with this award. Alejandra Romo, first grade teacher. Dana Garcia, kindergarten teacher. Lorinda Narison, third grade teacher. Angela Juarez, fourth grade teacher. Roxanne Moron, special education teacher. JJ Garcia, counselor. Erica Hovland, school nurse for the previous school year. Selena Allaire, family specialist and health fair organizer. Maribel Morales, receptionist. Valerie Rosales, administrative assistant. And also, she wasn't able to make it, but our cafeteria manager, Esmeralda Bernal. <laughs> so, <laughs> Nothing. No, no. Thank you all for being here and congratulations again. Item 8, Presentations A, Northeast Educational Foundation Annual Report to the Board of Trustees. Dr. Micah. Thank you, President Grone. At this time, I would like to ask Amy Lane, our Executive Director for Partnerships and the Northeast Educational Foundation, to come to the podium to, for this item. Thank you, Dr. Micah. Madam President, members of the board, executive staff, and guests, it is our honor tonight to be here to share with the board, uh, as good stewards of this partnership, our second fiscal year. We're entering into our third year of this partnership, so tonight we'll be going over the second fiscal year and the annual report. But before we get started, I have a wonderful NEF board behind me tonight who we would not be able to do any of this without, and so I would like to introduce each of them to you. I'm just gonna call their names. Um, while they deserve applause, we're gonna hold the applause until the end. Um, but I would like to introduce each one. So Miss Judy Wheeler is here, if you would just stand. Cheryl Staffier, Audra Fergone, Fred Morrison, Greg Thorne, Cindy Hernandez, our treasurer, Karen Funk, where are you? <laughs> and then I have uh, three of you at the dais, David Beyer, Dr. Micah, and Sandy Huey. Last but not least, I have our chairman, Randy Bristow. He's going to start us off this evening. Um, Amina from Johnson High stole, stole, stole all the good words I have for you tonight. Uh, I want to convey from the board of directors for the Northeast Educational Foundation our thanks for this collaboration. Um, you're going to see some numbers that are eye-popping in a good way. And you're going to see some really astounding things that have been accomplished in the last two years. They would not have been accomplished without the support of the board, period. Um, it, 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 we've, we've always been a well-run, well-managed organization, but in the last two years, and you'll see the results, and some of you are familiar with them already, uh, they're really astounding. But that could not happen without the collaboration of what you all have done for us on the board. So on behalf of the board, I'd like to thank you. I also want to thank you for these people. I think it's the next slide is um, the staff. Here we go, thank you. This is the A-team. 
Uh, this is who we're thanking you for. Uh, these individuals, uh, not all of them, do 100% uh, of the work for the foundation, as many of you know, as a part of the agreement of the Memorandum of Understanding, but we have access to them. Uh, and so it's a collaboration of the resources that are given to us, these fine people over here that are on the board there, also the directors, and of course, the rocket fuel that makes all this go is our donors. Um, we can't do it as, as we had the gala and I had all the directors stand and applaud the audience. We can't do it without the donations that come to us. That is what fuels this. And these individuals make it happen from the administrative side and their directors work very hard to raise those funds. So this is what we're looking at here. So with that in store, I'd like to thank you. That's the message I want to bring from the board tonight. Thanks, the board of directors for the foundation. Go ahead. Thank you, Randy. Yes. That is our main and most important message, is to thank you guys, because you're a part of everything that we do. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. Um, and one more time, since I didn't announce them, I just want to say that I do have the three uh, most hardworking ladies here, Carissa, Crystal, and Natalie, if you would just wave. So let's, let's get into it. Um, each year, you may not know that we start out with just $10,000 in our budget. Every year we start basically at ground zero and then we raise from there. At the end of the year, 25% is put into our permanent fund and everything else is given back to NEISD. I think that's important to note because each year, no matter what the economic um, marketplace is looking like, we do start at the bottom. So for the highlights for this year, we um, gave over half a million back to NEISD through donations. That includes our innovative grants, our Team NEISD funds, Big Give, and Designated Giving. The biggest number here is our 41% increase in our main mission, which is innovative grants back to our campuses. That went from 260,000 to 366,000. For a little bit of perspective on that, um, two of our sister districts, who I, I won't mention, but there are our two closest counterparts in size, for this year, they gave 246,000 and 200,000 respectively. So we are really proud of that 366,000 number. Um, those are established foundations that we really respect and look up to, and we have been learning from, and we're grateful for that, but we are proud that we are at the number we are at this year. We gave 106,000 back to NEISD through designated giving, and our permanent fund went up by 21%. What we gave to it was 125,000 this year. Last but not least, we believe there was a hundred percent increase in team spirit, <laughs> thanks to our new mascot, Sparky. Where is Sparky? <laughs> he really should be here. He should. He doesn't like presentations. He's a little shy. <laughs> he could have just danced in the back door. <laughs> it would make it so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Next year. Okay. Next year, Miss Corona. So our main revenue is tired from running in the uh, mascot race, That's right? right. <laughs> He's exhausted. <laughs> Sorry. So, no, I love it. Our main revenue streams are the golf tournament, the gala, <laughs> Big Give, our marketing tables, and Team NEISD. I know you can all read, so I won't point these out, but the two that made the biggest jump for us this year, for a gala um, of our size that we kind of thought was at capacity to increase 30%, we are very proud of that number. Um, big Give, 61% this year increase, and that is a grassroots fundraising effort. So that's um, people in our community giving $10, $15. And so we are proud of that number because it just shows the number of people behind our effort. New this year, as I mentioned, the Neef mascot. In all seriousness, um, we are trying to be strategic about marketing and branding. And we feel that for a school district, we've got to have a mascot. <laughs> if we're going to be a foundation for a school district. So his name is Sparky. He was named by one of our teachers. And he's just a way for everyone to remember that we really are about innovation. He is a light bulb, if you can't tell. Um, for Big Give SA, I mentioned that briefly, but we were, the numbers are a little bit um, faded, so I will share for the audience. We were number eighth in the city out of 100 nonprofits, hundreds of nonprofits. We were eighth in most raised and second in most donors. 
Um, you'll also notice that there's only one other public ISD in that top 10 leaderboard, and we are the leading public ISD in that leaderboard. And so in terms of visibility in the city, this really skyrocketed us in the nonprofit area. I got a lot of calls the next week. What are you guys doing? So for okay. us, we felt like visibility <laughs> Visibility wise, um, it was a big win. And then our Innovation Celebration Grant Tour, our first one was this past fiscal year. That is where we invite our top donors on a school bus driven by the great Ron Clary. And they are able to surprise three of our teachers with uh, innovative grants. And so in the past, we used to do this just with our directors, and we felt like it's important for donors to get to see that look of surprise on the teachers' faces. And so that's what our Innovation Celebration Grant Tour has become. I thought this was the most telling. We did not target this, but for the first time, we had three individuals this year. Their family chose to list the Northeast Educational Foundation um, in their obituary. And they trusted us with those funds and to honor their legacy. And so to me, I felt like that really was the most telling um, method to show that we've become transparent and trusted that you would list us in your loved one's obituary. So because of that, we wanted to honor them one more time. You'll see if you have the hard copy of the report in front of you or if you can read those words, that these um, weren't all educators, but they were all touched by NEISD. And so, it, it really shows that no matter what stage of life you're in, NEISD is affecting a lot of uh, folks in our community, and we wanted to honor them one more time by listing them in our annual report. So this year, as I mentioned, 366,000 back to innovative grants. This covered 60 grants across the district and several district-wide grants. These are things, some of my favorites, an aerospace simulator at Eisenhower, lots of augmented virtual reality, um, greenhouse, and uh, actually a greenhouse for Colonial Hills, who was here earlier tonight, and uh, filmmaking equipment. So lots of high tech, but then also a lot of hands-on, innovative projects. We are still giving our new teacher supply grants. Uh, new teachers to the district are eligible for this, and this is to help them outfit their rooms. This year we gave 28,000 to 140 new teachers, and these come in the form of $200 Office Depot cards for items that must remain in that classroom uh, throughout the year. Our social media, this is something that we are, um, was new to us a few years ago, and so we're just efforting and proving that each year. As you'll see, we've gone up through the past year, but it's something that we continue to focus on. And then again, back to the numbers. So since our partnership, I want to point out, in 2017, 16-17, we were not partnered with NEISD, and so the amount given back to NEISD was 218000 since our partnership, we are just a little under a million dollars just over the past two years. So that's $974,828 because of you, because of your faith in us and your commitment to NEF. And so we're, we're proud of that. We know we want to grow that. We know we have a long way to go. Um, but it, it really is all because of the support that you've given NEF. For a little bit of historical information, in 2013, that was my first year here, seven years ago, uh, NEF was giving just a little over 100,000 back to NEISD each year. And it was pretty stable, but it, it was getting to be stagnant. So we're proud that we have an upward trajectory, and um, we hope that we'll continue to bring bigger numbers every year to you. Beyond the numbers, the soft skills of NEF, I know that numbers talk, but we feel that we're also building strong advocates for NEISD. Uh, each, each month, I, these directors, especially the ones here tonight, they are here many, many times in a month, but I would say they average at least two visits, either to an event or to a meeting per month. And so now that we're up to 40 board members, that's a strong group of advocates for public education and Northeast in particular. Um, our guide star rating of transparency, we're in the 0.05% of nonprofits with a gold level of transparency. 
Our name recognition in the community, we talked about Big Give. We're still working on that. We're still working on um, name recognition within our own community, within teachers and um, within our students and within this building. And so that's something that we'll continue to work on. And then retention, I mentioned this because Randy and I um, got a letter from a teacher that specifically addressed the fact that our project that we gave was one of the reasons she was staying in Northeast. Oh, wow. And so we do feel that when you're funding these pet projects, a teacher feels more invested in their campus and, and will be likely to remain on their campus. Put a little face to some of these projects. This is Jody Collins. There's a longer story about him in the, in the annual report, but he is a student at Nimitz. He enjoys uh, building their water conservation program there. They have a windmill. If you've been on the campus at Nimitz, this is just a lovely little oasis in the middle of a lot of concrete, to be honest. And so they're able to grow things in the middle of Nimitz. And it was wonderful to get to see that program. Here's one of the teachers we funded, Ginger Cunningham from Northern Hills. Um, we funded her during the Innovation Celebration Grant Tour, and she was sobbing, as you can tell. Um, she has made this phenomenal room at Northern Hills. And if you're not familiar with the sensory room, this is designed just to be used for five to 10 minutes to refocus, especially for special education students. Um, but it can be used for all of the students as a refocusing tool. So I'm gonna show you a brief video. And this was actually made by Ginger. Um, and it was the first day that the equipment was used by the students. see um, we are seeing a wide range from very high tech to very low tech that teachers are applying for and we feel that they're both innovative in their own ways um, so thank you thank you for helping us make that possible and I'm going to let our chairman Randy Bristow finish us off um, yeah I do want to reiterate uh, one of the numbers up there that was uh, real interesting and that was the uh, numbers on the big give um, what we looked at it really represents to us the vertical and horizontal growth in our donor base. Um, and it was really interesting to be atop of that leaderboard um, all day uh, for about 48 hours. Um, uh, we were up there with groups like the San Antonio Zoo, San Antonio Museum of Art, Our Lady of the Lake University, St. You know, Mary's University. Those are the kinds of organizations that we stood next to. And then, of course, we uh, procured the grant. Many of you know at Camelot Elementary, we stood on a small stage with about a dozen other uh, nonprofits in town, and they were of that size and caliber. 
Uh, and, and so that kind of recognition is ex extremely important for uh, the continuation and growth of our directors. And uh, all of them are extremely committed toward the goal of, of uh, Northeast Independent School District taking its rightful place. With the 10th largest school district, we want to have a foundation that is of that caliber and size and has the impact statewide. Uh, we think that we're outpacing our peers. That's, that's for them. It's not, again, it's not a competition. But uh, if you're keeping track, we are outpacing <laughs> our peers uh, in, here in town. But we, want to, uh, we do want to uh, look beyond that uh, at the Sci Fairs, the Austin ISDs, the Katy uh, School Districts, and others that we want to be competitive with. So uh, with your continued support, it can be made possible. And we want to do the best that we can with the resources available. So again, thank you. That is our presentation. It's a little bit nerve-wracking packing a year into a presentation, so I apologize if we went too fast or too slow. Do you have any questions for us? I do have one question. I just want to clarify, the Team NEISD, is that the program where NEISD employees could donate monthly? Thank you so much for asking yes. that. It is. It's an okay. employee payroll deduction. It has been for the first two years. In front of you, you have our third year continuation of that. So next year, we hope to share with you how we've grown that into a community campaign, okay. a comprehensive annual campaign that includes parents and business partners. Thank you so much. You guys do such a great job. Mm -hmm. Any other? <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. You're doing an amazing job, and we just can't thank you enough for um, everything that you and your wonderful um, ladies that won't stand up in the third row. <laughs> they don't always listen. I, but, if, but if I tell them, they'll have to do it. But I'm just kidding. Um, but a, and it, it is all about the competition, Randy. We want to be the best, so come on. We're going to do it. Ms. Grona is very competitive. Item nine, board business. A, possible action to, a, goodbye y'all. Um, possible action to appoint trustee to fill vacancy from single member district three. Um, do I have a motion to appoint a trustee to fill vacancy single member district three? So moved. Do you want to say who it is? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought we were going to move right along here. Uh. <laughs> okay. Do you, um, do I have a motion to appoint Omar Leos as the uh, trustee to fill vacancy from single member district three? Sure, uh, Madam President. I would move that we uh, move to appoint uh, Mr. Leos as as the uh, trustee from single member district three. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Winkley. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Oppose. The motion carries. Um, after a very thoughtful and deliberate process, the board is happy to appoint Omar Leos to fill the vacant District 3 trustee position. There, there were many great applicants, but ultimately we feel that Mr. Leos is the best person to fill the District 3 seat. Mr. Leos is the Fine Arts Coordinator at Harlandale ISD and has been an educator serving public school districts for 20 years. We feel Mr. Leos's experience in serving students, parents, and community members and public education will serve the district well. Mr. Leos will fill the position until May of 2020, at which time the seat will be up for election. Item B, possible action regarding ballot cast for Bear Appraisal District Board of Directors for 2020-2021. Um, okay, we've been talking about this for months, it seems like. And so we ha had a candidate. So we need to determine what candidate um, we want to cast our vote for. And we have a resolution. Did she ever leave that? Oh. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Um, so do I have a candidate that we would like to um, cast our vote for? Um, for this resolution for the Bear Appraisal District. Were we going to do um, John Fisher? John Fisher. Yeah, there's, um, and we have 786 votes. So we're going to cast all of our votes. Okay, so do I have a motion to um, cast our 786 votes for John Fisher? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Byer. Do I have a second? 
Second. Thank you, Mrs. Winkley. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. For the first time in 19 years, I can vote for the appraisal district. So there is not a recusal <laughs> on this one. Yeah. So did you vote? I did. Okay. I said yes. Okay. I said aye. Okay. Um, item 10, new business for possible board action, A, resolutions. One, possible action regarding resolution recognizing December 2019 as Socks for Students Month and December 16, 2019 as Socks for Students Day. So, because we have a new superintendent, he likes socks. We have the committee thought it would be, and this is awesome, the committee thought it would be a great idea to um, do a sock drive. And the socks will be donated to the clothes closet. Oh, she's already left. PTA clothes closet, correct? And so um, we have this wonderful resolution. Did you read it? Do I need to read it? Yes. I need to read the resolution? Yes. Okay. Are you going to start? First of all, I think we should all. <laughs> I don't even have any socks. There's a bag of socks. <laughs> By order of the. That's a, that's a big bag By of order. <laughs> okay. They're really We're, cute. They're adorable. Thank you, Miss Huey, for um, that's right. doing all that. Whereas it is the sense of this governing body inspired by Superintendent Dr. Sean Micah and his appeal with SOX to proclaim December 1st to 20, 2019 as SOX for Students Month and December 16th, 2019 as SOX for Students Day, encouraging district staff, parents, and our community to contribute to this cause that will provide SOX for many students of the NAISD. And whereas clothing donations to our PTA clothes closet rarely includes much needed socks, and whereas a pair of socks is basic in that they prevent blisters and protect the feet from internal structures of shoes, as well as help insulate the feet from cold surfaces, and whereas the simplicity of socks can make so much difference for a child, and whereas the need for clean, dry socks is a necessity that will provide comfort to our children who may otherwise struggle in the classroom with the distraction of having cold or wet feet, and whereas children who have one pair of socks, which can last only so long, are given back dignity when they own new, non-tattered socks. And whereas it is the interest of the Board of Trustees to raise awareness of the simple and basic need to help keep our children comfortable and focused with healthy and warm feet. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees pause its deliberations to approve this resolution inspired by our superintendent, Dr. Sean Micah, to proclaim December 1st to 20, 2019 as Socks for Students Month and December 16th, 2019 as Socks for Students Day. Adopted this 11th day of November, 2019. So now do I have a motion to approve the resolution? So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Winkley. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Huey. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose the motion carries. So. Hey, I may have some socks. <laughs> those aren't for you. New socks. I know, but I have some of them. New socks. Right, so you need are... to donate new socks. We need for to those of you all in the flavor. audience, I think, I think Dr. Newman said it best. You just throw your socks away after that you wear them once. I probably have 100 pairs of socks. I love fun socks. So thank you very much for this. This is something I can get behind. <laughs> this is awesome. So we will donate. Um, yeah, there's Fortnite. So remember. We um, to donate socks, please. There's going to be a bin in the lobby here, and then around the district. Beginning December first. All right. Item B: Instruction and Campus Administration. One possible action regarding resolution regarding NEISD slash TRS health supplement. Dr. Newman. Thank you, President Grona, members of the board, Dr. Mike, executive staff and guests. I'd like to ask Shiley Witten, our senior director for HR, to address this item. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Micah, executive staff, ladies and gentlemen. In August 2019, we had an employee who contacted the Human Resources Department to inquire why they no longer were receiving the monthly NEISD supplement, formerly known as the TRS Health Supplement. It was discovered at that time that the method to track this payment for identified employees did not completely transfer over when the district implemented a new data management system in July of 2014. 
As a result, 74 employees have had the supplemental payment inadvertently removed. Since the error occurred over past school years, we are presenting a resolution to authorize administration to make a one-time lump sum payment to these impacted individuals. We further propose rolling the monthly supplement amount into all eligible employees' hourly or annualized rate of pay to prevent any potential for further errors. So before you, we have an agenda item and resolution requesting your approval. Yes. Does anybody have any questions about this? No. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the resolution to retroactively compensate the 74 affected employees? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hosso. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Byer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose. The motion carries. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Um, item B, instruction in campus administration. One, possible action regarding resolution regard. Oh, wait. Hello. Next one. Nick, turn the page. Item two. <laughs> Possible. I wanted to do it again. It, it was quick and easy. Yeah. <laughs> the next one's going to um, not be. Item two, possible action regarding accountability <laughs> overview. <laughs> Effective schools framework and targeted improvement plans. Dr. Newman. Thank you, President Grona, members of the board, Dr. Mike, executive staff and guests. As you may recall, July's update 113 contained new verbiage for AIA, AIB, and AIC legal regarding accountability requirements. AIA legal established that not only would campuses receive overall letter grades, but the individual domains in the accountability system would now receive grades. AIC legal established that targeted improvement plans, or TIPS, would be used. Historically, only campuses that were rated improvement required by TEA had required a plan be, to be presented to the board. Currently, in addition to any campus with an overall D or F, schools that received a D or F in any of the domains, regardless of the overall campus rating, needs to develop a plan and be approved by the board. Originally, TEA provided a detailed template for the TIP that had to be used. In September, they stated that for certain campuses, the campus improvement plan could be used instead of the TIP template. A number of central office staff have been hard at work collaborating with each other and the campus principals, who I might add have worked tirelessly with their respective staff to work on these plans. At this time, Jennifer Gutierrez and Susan Diaz, our executive director for elementary and secondary curriculum instruction, will now take you through the work and present the plans for your approval. Thank you. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Micah, executive staff, colleagues, and guests. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the team that has been instrumental throughout the development of targeted improvement plans, Brandy Merriman, performance and planning, Dr. Gloria Canada, Jane Jensen, Dr. Justin Oxley, Joe Reasons in Campus Administration, Colleen Borman and Eric Wicker in Learning Support Services, Kristen Williams in Special Education, and Susan Diaz and Alicia Alvarez Calderon in Curriculum and Instruction. This truly has been a team effort, and during my presentation, when I refer to the instructional core team, I'm referring to this amazing team. I also want to acknowledge um, John Merrill, principal of Montgomery Elementary, Colleen Bloom, principal of Oak Grove Elementary, and Alan Ruckus, principal of Harmony Hills. They are here with us this evening, and they have, as Dr. Newman mentioned, worked endless hours with their teams to develop their targeted improvement plans. Our presentation tonight will provide you with an overview of the A through F accountability system and development of targeted improvement plans through the TA Effective School Framework. And that was Dr. Newman. Okay. So the Texas Academic Performance Report, which we refer to as the TAPR, is not released until December. At that time, we provide you with a detailed report um, highlighting district results. Since the TAPAR report is not available at this time, we will provide you again with an overview of the A through F accountability system in order to assist you with understanding the alignment with targeted improvement plans. Okay, thank you. So this slide represents um, an overview of the accountability system. The accountability system is comprised of three domains as you can see here in this image. I will explain the details of each 
in upcoming slides, each domain receives a letter grade. Scale scores were created to align uh, the scale score to the letter grade. And um, although domain two, as you can see there, it has two components, student progress and relative performance, it is only given one letter grade, the best of the two. Um, all, domain, all three domains are used to measure state accountability, and domain three directly aligns with the federal requirements. In elementaries and middle schools um, for our, go back, I'm sorry. Domain one, student achievement. Uh, measures student achievement on all subjects and all tests. So this is math, reading, science, social studies, and writing. Um, student assessment scores are reported using for performance levels, does not meet approaches, meets, and masters. Um, for our student achievement domain one, you can see here that at the elementary schools, uh, our domain one is based solely on star achievement. And for high schools and districts, our score is weighted using star, uh, percentage of annual graduates that accomplish the college, career, and military, me military excuse me, readiness components, and then graduation rate. This slide shows our district domain one score. Um, you can also see the distribution of scores across our elementary schools, our middle schools, and our high schools for domain one. So our domain one overall score was an 86. Domain two, as I mentioned earlier, has two components, school progress and relative performance, um, but it only receives one letter grade, the best of 2A or 2B. So in domain 2A, um, we're measuring school progress. So credit is awarded for students who meet or exceed progress on star reading and star math only. Those are the two pieces that are evaluated. Um, they use the student's previous year's star score uh, as the growth measure. So that is used as the baseline. And in domain two, we are evaluating relative performance. So the achievement on all students compared to campuses or districts with similar socioeconomic statuses. Here is our domain 2A score and the distribution of 2A scores across our district. So our overall 2A score is an 80. And I want you to remember this overall because we'll use it in the next coming upcoming slides. So in do domain 2B, um, they use the domain one district star and CCMR average, that college career and military readiness average and the district percent of economically disadvantaged students to determine the overall score. So as you can see here on the x-axis, it shows our district percent of economically disadvantaged at 48.4. The y-axis shows the district domain average, star, and CCMR. These two numbers are entered into a scale score calculator uh, to give us our overall grade. And here is our overall grade um, in relative performance as a district. Um, we are in 89, and then again, you can see the distribution across our schools. As I said, to remember that 2A score, that 2A score was in 80 for school progress, and now in 89 in the 2B portion. Um, so the best of the two is in 89. So our domain two score was in 89. Our final domain is domain three, closing the gaps. This domain aligns the state accountability system with the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is the federal framework that replaced No Child Left Behind. And this one becomes uh, a little more complicated, as you can see here. In domain three, we are evaluating student performance by disaggregating it through the student groups to ensure educational equity amongst all students. So the left shows the different student groups evaluated in this domain. In order for a group to be a component of domain three, um, it must have at least 25 students in that group. Um, in NEISD, we have schools with as little as five groups for some of our smaller campuses, and some schools with 12 groups for some of our larger campuses. As a district, we are evaluated on all 14 student groups, 
and one student may count under multiple student groups. For example, they will count under all students. They may count under Hispanic, economically disadvantaged, current and monitored English learners, and continuously enrolled. So as you can see, one student may count under several student groups. On the right, you will see all of the components that are measured in Domain 3. And so I'm going to start with um, the yellow, Academic Achievement in Reading and Math. And this measures uh, star performance in reading and math at the meets grade level. So approaches um, is not a performance level that the federal uh, guidelines accepted. So we're um, only looking at the meets grade level at this point. And each student group's performance is then compared to the academic targets uh, for 2019. When we're looking at the green component, growth in reading and math at elementary and middle schools, um, this provides an opportunity to receive credit for star results in reading and math for students that either met or exceeded the criteria for the star progress measure. So the star progress measure indicates the amount of improvement or growth uh, a student has made from year to year. Then we move to uh, four-year federal graduation requirements, again in green, uh, for our high schools and districts. Uh, this is uh, measured using the federal four-year graduation rate of the class of 2018. Student groups that are at or above 90% are required to exceed that rate by at least a tenth of a percent in the following years. Um, we move to the lighter yellow component, which is student achievement domain score for elementary and middle schools. And this measures all tests and all subject areas tested. Each student group is evaluated on the average percent of assessment results that are at the approaches, meets, and master's grade level standard. So each student group's performance is then compared to the domain three targets. For high schools and district, uh, it measures students' preparedness for college, the workforce, or the military. And the final one is our English language proficiency status. Um, this is uh, measured using the Texas English language proficiency assessment, which we call the TALPASS. And the English language proficiency of current kinder through 12th grade English language learners is assessed in four language domains, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So a student is considered having uh, made progress if the student advances by at least one score on the composite rating from the prior year to the current year, um, or the student's result is already at advanced high. So our domain three score of an 89 was actually a forced ranked score. Um, our actual score in domain three was a 93. Actu uh, accountability rules changed, as Dr. Newman mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. And if a district um, has a school with a D or F in a domain, the highest score that the district can receive is an 89. So here you will see um, our overall domain scores. Um, if you remember again, 2A and 2B uh, is the best of, so our 2B score is an 89. And then domain one um, and domain two, again, we're looking for the best of. So we'll take our 89 for domain uh, one or two, which is the best of. That makes up 70% of our overall score, and then we have our domain three score of an 89, which makes up 30% uh, of our overall score. If we look at our final overall grade compared to the previous year, we're definitely trending in the right direction. We know that we still have a lot of work to do in this continuous cycle of improvement, but we're definitely moving in the right direction. Um, Again, we would have earned an overall grade of a 90 um, if it would not have been for the force ranked 89 in domain three. Okay. So we are now moving to um, the TEA interventions and supports based on accountability results. And so to the left, you will see the most intensive support and intervention. And as we move to the right, um, you can see the least intensive supports and interventions um, that are assigned. So to the left, you can see designations, again, that required the most intensive support. So campuses with an overall F rating 
are required to use the TEA template to develop a targeted improvement plan aligned to the effective school framework, and these targeted improvement plans are monitored by TEA. Campuses with an overall D rating are also required to use the TEA template to develop a targeted improvement plan um, aligned to the effective school framework, but these are monitored in-house by the instructional core team. And initially in August, we were informed that campuses with a D or F in a domain were going to be required to use the TEA template uh, for targeted improvement plans. But in September, those rules changed and uh, they were given the option to use the TEA template or um, to include their targeted improvement plans in our campus improvement plans. Um, now we move to federal requirements. So the Closing the Gaps Domain 3 is used to identify schools under federal requirements. Uh, again, moving on the chart from most intensive to least intensive. So comprehensive support and improvement is identified when a campus score in Domain 3 falls within the lowest 5% of Title I campuses in the state of Texas. And a TA monitor targeted improvement plan uh, aligned to the effective school framework is required. The next section is the targeted support and improvement. Um, and this is identified when a student group does not meet three of the same targets for three consecutive years. And their targeted improvement plan is developed and included within their campus improvement plan. An additional targeted support and improvement is identified when a student group misses all targets during uh, the current year and a targeted improvement plan is developed and included within their campus improvement plan. So we have 39 NEISD schools that met all state and federal requirements. You can see them here broken up by elementary, middle school, and high school, and those that are bold are title campuses. This chart shows a number of campuses that require interventions based on the components previously reviewed. The x-axis shows a number of schools requiring interventions and support based on the federal requirements, and the y-axis shows those requiring in interventions and support based on the state accountability. You can see that some campuses fall into both. Uh, for example, we have 11 campuses that received a D or F in a domain, but also fall under targeted improvement plan, uh, targeted support and improvement for missing the targets for a specific student group for three years. While the previous slide showed you the counts um, uh, of the campuses in each category, this slide indicates the names of the campuses. School names in brown represent um, schools using the targeted improvement plan template from TEA. Note that for our overall F's and D's in a domain, those that are brown chose to use the targeted improvement plan form from TEA. The campuses um, that are outlined in, in black have included their targeted improvement plan within their campus improvement plans. Campuses that are underlined are all Title I campuses. And you can also see the letter grades, the overall letter grades assigned to those campuses right next to their name. Um, if they have an asterisk, they have also received a distinction or more, one or more. You want to go back to that slide? No, but <clears throat> would you explain to them how they receive a distinction? Yes. They are compared to campuses with similar demographics, um, and they fall within the top 25% of their scores. It is based on performance. It's master's, master's scores. Can you back up just one, Brandy, mm -hmm. back to that? So, for instance, you can take any of those schools that have an asterisk. Yeah. They were in the top quartile in some form, yet yeah. okay. they're... They're still identified for targeted improvement. Or okay. Dr. Mike, if I could just point out that 
Kruger Middle School actually did receive five distinctions. <laughs> Does this require a calculus by any chance? I'm just wondering because I'm an abacus. <laughs> So the effective school framework was developed by TEA to support schools continuous improvement through um, an aligned diagnostic process. So you can see here in this effective school framework image that uh, it is made up of five prioritized levers. Looking at the image that represents the effective school framework at the core of the image is effective instruction. And then the instructional core is strengthened by high quality curriculum, positive school culture, effective well-supported teachers, and strong school leadership and planning surrounds the entire school framework. So um, these are again the five levers that make up the effective school framework. We have provided you a summary in your folder of the Effective School Framework. Page one is just an introduction and purpose, which is what I have done, um, I've summarized. And all of the pages thereafter in your packet provide an in-depth detail of each of the five uh, levers and district commitments that were, that were used to develop the targeted improvement plan. So the, the process um, that we followed to develop targeted improvement plans, the first step was identified what we call a DCSI, a district coordinator of school improvement. And that is Dr. Gloria Canada, Dr. Justin Oxley, Jane Jensen, Joe Reasons. They serve as our district uh, DCSIs for the campuses following the targeted improvement plans. Each campus established a campus leadership team uh, Dr. Canada, John Merrill, Tallene Bloom, Alan Ruckus, Brandy Merriman, and myself attended an intensive two-day effective school framework training at Region 20. All other identified campuses received the effective school training in-house by the instructional core team. And once they received the um, effective school framework training, the campus team began with a campus self-assessment that aligned directly to the five levers and all of the components in the effective school framework. They deeply analyzed data by teacher, by campus, by grade level. They went through a barrier analysis, looking for trends, looking for patterns, and all of this information um, helped them develop their targeted improvement plan. The three prioritized actions in their targeted improvement plan come from their three lowest areas in their self-assessment when they, um, as a campus, as a leadership team, took that self-assessment aligned to the five prioritized levers. The prioritized actions are then broken down into cycles, so their annual goal is then broken up into uh, three 90-day cycles to help them achieve their goal by the end of the year. Uh, once their targeted improvement plan was developed, each campus held a public meeting to solicit input from the community. Implementation and monitoring um, uh, components require us to collect evidence, to review the plan, to gather data, and to support. Um, the instructional court team provides support to the campuses throughout that 90-day cycle to ensure that they're on target to meet. Um, their goals, and um, as you saw in your packet, there are district commitments and district actions, so we have to make sure that those are aligned to their goals um, and that meet their needs, again, in order to help them uh, move forward with their targeted improvement plan. So the instructional core team really serves as a support system to help them achieve their targeted improvement plan. So at this time, um, it is my pleasure to ask uh, John Merrill, principal of Montgomery, Montgomery Elementary, to come up and share his story with us. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Micah, executive staff, and guests. It's my pleasure to be here today to share some information in regards to our targeted improvement plan at Montgomery Elementary. I've given much thought about what I wanted to share with you in such a short amount of time. Above all else, I want you to know that the work that we're doing together as a staff serving Montgomery under incredible pressure is extremely personal, highly emotional, 
and 100% unified. Upon learning of our accountability results in June, my staff and I shared together in the disappointment and frustration of earning the F rating. We allowed ourselves um, to grieve as a staff and then quickly transferred all of our energy into genuine reflection and a focus on changing our story. I want to ensure you that every person is dedicated and driven not only to greatly improving accountability results, but to develop systems and processes for our students to thrive for many years to come. We're not looking to implement quick fixes or band-aids. Rather, we're investing in proven practices such as utilizing an effective coaching model, participating in vertical professional learning communities, tracking student data with fidelity, providing students with the tools needed to set and track their own personal goals, and ensuring that we're educated in implementing best practices to serve the vast social and emotional needs of the Montgomery community. The targeted improvement plan that you received this evening has been touched by nearly every member on campus. The initial foundation was created by my grade level and instructional leadership teams. Together, we spent significant time off campus developing a thorough plan. During the formation of this plan, we identified three targeted areas of improvement significant milestones with each cycle, and a hard look at the barriers that we face in order to achieve our goals. And after much time and collaboration, the initial plan was developed. This plan was presented to our Campus Improvement Committee, and feedback was provided and adjustments were made to meet the needs of our campus. Finally, the plan that you see before you today was presented to the entire faculty. As a campus, we reviewed our targets, milestones, and we had real conversations about the current state of our campus, and what we together have to do to change the story of Montgomery. We know that in order for our story to be fully told and for all the incredible things that take place within our walls to be fully appreciated, we must change the way in which we approach how our students learn. And that is exactly what we are doing. This evening, I'd also like to share with you that as a campus, we have received tremendous support from central office. Dr. Canada, Jennifer Gutierrez, Brandy Merriman have been instrumental in providing guidance on navigating this complex process and ensuring that we've been supported in every step of the way. Finally, I want you to know that I am confident that we will not only rise to the occasion, but surpass all expectations. We have an incredible team of dedicated, servant-minded professionals who are doing everything in their power to ensure that our students and community are served in the way in which they deserve. Everyone on campus is there because they choose to be there. We are truly a family, and during difficult times, families stick together, and that is exactly what we're doing at Montgomery. Thank you again for your time, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have of me. Does anyone have any questions? Great presentation, Mr. Right. Merrill. That Thank was you. amazing. I yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> I love your passion. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. Now we have Dr. Canada, who's worked directly. Uh, last year, she worked directly with our two improvement required campuses. This year, she is the district coordinator of school improvement for our three campuses who are going through the targeted improvement plan that is being monitored by TEA. And so she's going to share her story with us. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Micah, executive staff, and guests. I was asked to share with you how we changed the story for two campuses that had an F rating last year. Last November, and then again in January, I received calls from Dr. Micah and Dr. Newman. They explained that there were two campuses with an F rating and felt it would take someone on the ground whose sole purpose was to figure out the missing pieces of the puzzle. So this was before the state had even created the title or position of DCSI, or the District Coordinator of School Improvement. Northeast was thinking a step ahead, and they were ready to do whatever it was going to take. I want to point out that both campuses last year, and the three that I'm working with this year, are Title I campuses. I point this out not as an excuse, but because it's worth noting that many of the children on these campuses come to school every day fighting an uphill battle, living with circumstances beyond their control. Serving as the principal as of a successful Title I campus for 12 years changed my life. I witnessed the struggles every day that the kids were going through. And I know from personal experience 
that we can change the trajectory of those stories. Every decision needs to be made through the lens of our purpose. One, to raise the bar both in teaching and in learning, and two, to provide a safe, nurturing environment in which learning can take place. Working closely with campus leadership, very honest and sometimes difficult conversations took place on many topics, analyzing data, looking for the gaps, providing systems and structures with clear lines of communication, creating schedules that maximize learning time, placing teachers strategically and using their strengths, providing purposeful professional development, targeting interventions and providing after school or before school tutoring, monitoring consistently being in the classrooms, holding everybody accountable, creating positive school cultures, making it a place where children want to come, and celebrating our milestones along the way. I did not do this alone. It took the principals, every teacher, every staff member, the academic coaches, every specialist I stole from Jennifer, um, every office at central office, every, every department such as transportation, they made extra runs for us so that we could get the kids home for a late tutoring. Um, we had food services that provided snacks and packed them up and met the kids with a smile after school at the end of a long day. But most importantly, it took the children believing in themselves to begin to change the stories of their lives. Northern Hills in half a year raised their rating from an F to a C. West Avenue raised their rating from an F to a B. Grit, dogged determination, teamwork, and the belief in our ability of our children is what makes every person in this room a part of the child's story of success. This is Northeast. Thank you. That is the end of our presentation. Do you have any questions that we can answer for you? One quick clarification. I think it was in, if I got this right, again, I'm not good at calculus, so I don't know what, <laughs> if this had this right or not, but it said in domain one in elementary school, it's the, it's the star test. 100% 100%. of their score comes from the STAR test. So um, they're looking at their scores on the science, reading, math, right. um, writing, assessment, and they look at the approaches, meets, and masters, and they average that score. Okay. But then in domain three, that STAR test is looked at again, so they get... <laughs> yes, and now they have okay. targets okay. at the so meets level only. Right. Okay. Yes. You didn't need calculus. I did not need calculus. <laughs> You're welcome. Any other questions? Anybody else? No. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you to you and your team and everybody. Again, who's, it was a team effort. So thanks yes. And Dr. Canada, thank you so much for sharing your story. It was very moving. Um, it, we've just got great people here doing great things. So thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. So this evening, administrative staff recommends that the Board of Trustee approve the targeted improvement plans for the 2019-2020 mm -hmm. school year as presented. Do I have a motion to approve the targeted improvement plans as presented? So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Winkley. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Byer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose the motion carries. Thank Thanks you. again, Jennifer. Item three, possible action regarding 2019-2020 campus improvement plans. Dr. Newman. Thank you, President Grona, members of the board, Dr. Micah, executive staff and guests. Every year we bring you our campus improvement plans for approval. Uh, we now bring you the 2019-20 campus improvement plans for your approval. And at this time, it looks like we have Susan Diaz and Pete Martinez, uh, the principal of MacArthur, and Susan Diaz, our executive director of secondary, to address this item. Good evening, Madam President, uh, members of the board, Dr. Micah, executive staff, and guests. Texas Education Code 11.253C requires that each school year, 
The principal of each campus, with the assistance of the campus level committee, shall develop, review, and revise the campus instructional improvement plan. The purpose of the campus level plan is to improve student performance for all student populations. The proposed 2019-2020 campus instructional imp improvement plans are located on the Northeast website. Brandy will demonstrate how to navigate to them. I'm nervous because this is the first time I've ever presented to you. Well, you're doing a great job. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go to the About NEISD and you click on the campus and district instructional improvement plans and then you can type in any school you want. In this instance, we're going to use MacArthur t tonight. So the cover for each plan includes the board goals, and we ask that every plan include each board goal, address each board goal. At the bottom of the cover page in the purple bar, there is a statement requiring each campus to review their plan a minimum of four times a year, as this is a fluid document and should be updated regularly. At the top of every page of the plans, the required components are listed. They include the board goals and the targeted area, which is merely the topic as a reference to organize the plan. So nothing about this plan has changed from last year, if you remember. So the measurable evaluation criteria column is where the campuses list how they will measure the success of each objective. The next column contains the performance objectives and strategies. The objective is based on the needs assessment and is what the campus is planning to accomplish. The strategies describe how the objective will be met. Last year, we added a formative assessment column for the campuses to monitor progress throughout the year toward their evaluation criteria, and they got to choose how often they were going to do this, so a lot of them put once a semester or once, once each nine weeks, so that was kind of up to them how they would monitor their formative checks. Um, and these, they could use things like sign-in sheets, classroom walks, lesson plans, benchmark scores, or any other points of data they thought were relevant to the formative checks. The next column is the timeline and the staff responsible, followed by resources needed to reach the performance objective. While every campus is unique in their development process, we would like to turn the mic over to Mr. Pete Martinez to share the process MacArthur uses to create their campus plan. Following his presentation, we, were, we are both happy to address any general questions you may have. And he, uh, Mr. Martinez has also brought some of his staff with him, but I'll let him uh, tell you a little bit about them. <clears throat> Madam President, members of the board, uh, Dr. Micah, executive staff and guests, thank you so much for this opportunity. Yes, I brought with me my core staff because they are the beginning, they are the starting point of where we start our campus improvement plan. I will tell you that 14, 15 years, 14 years ago now, I forget how long I've been here. Uh, the campus improvement plan was somewhat of a mystery. It was something that the principal did and they put it together. It was more of a task than a, a, a guide. And I will say that over the years, I've seen this grow into something more of what we have now, which is an active guide that, that leads us to where we should be going. And it's what it should have always been, but it takes time sometimes to do that. And so it requires a great team, and I'm very fortunate to have a very strong team at MacArthur. Uh, my curriculum AP, Mr. Larry Chavez. My uh, math dean, uh, Nicole, Mr. Cole Priest. My science dean, Dr. Kara Franz. Yes, I have a doctor on staff, thank you. <laughs> my English dean, uh, Ms., uh, Alex Clark Gonzalez. And my social studies dean, and sometimes basketball coach, Mr. <laughs> Rob Shapiro. So this is, a, uh, we have a great team. And how we do this, uh, we always start out, number one, by reflecting on our previous year. We pull out the old uh, with this small team and look at what we had set as goals. Did we meet those? Did this really meet what we were looking for? Did it do what it was supposed to do? Uh, as we review that, we look at a lot of data uh, among things. Of, of course, star data, which is what, why I have these core, uh, my deans there, because these are the areas that get tested every year. These are the areas that are most focused on. But we also look at attendance. We look at AP data, how much AP testing are we doing, uh, SAT data, discipline data, uh, the uh, pass and fail rate, um, not only for teachers but for the campus as a whole. Uh, we look at all the assessments. We look at the aware data that we have. Uh, what, what do our assessments tell us? And then from that, we begin to uh, formulate ideas about 
what should we be working on, what did not work, and how should we be changing that. At that point, we take it to all of our departments and we incorporate all of the departments on campus. That includes career tech, that includes fine arts, that includes athletics, that includes everyone, where we begin looking at the plan as a whole and saying, where do you fit into this plan? How do we work on this together? So those take it back to their department so that every teacher is a part and has a hand in what we are talking about doing and how does that department, because it's how does the uh, um, uh, career tech department help with the goals in English? How do the English help with the goals in the career tech department? How do we help across? Uh, and we've learned more about that over the years. Uh, once that's done, we take the, uh, uh, as a large group, we come together, we begin formulating what we bring back from our individual teams. That becomes our plan that we uh, move forward uh, to our uh, camp campus improvements committee where it's reviewed again. The campus improvement committee is made up of, uh, of course, myself, Teachers from every department, uh, our, um, a member from central office, our PTA president, uh, at least one community member, and one parent other than the PTA president. And we send that CIIP out ahead of time. We give them time ahead, so at least two weeks in advance, they receive the CIIP so they have a chance to really review it, look through it, see if there's something that they see. We come together, we discuss it, and then we give them at least two weeks to make any additional changes or recommendations. Once that's done, uh, then we submit our, that becomes our campus improvement plan, which you are seeing tonight. Uh, what we learned in the process um, this year was that there was a lot of things we thought we were doing right that we weren't doing right. For example, PLCs. We thought we had PLCs down. We thought we were doing what we were supposed to be doing. And then the, we were, they had an opportunity to become part of the first PLC cohort, which we did. We jumped on that and we realized we were missing the boat. We weren't looking at data nearly enough. We need to be looking at more data. We need to be looking at it more frequently. See, frequently. We had to have more checkpoints. Um, so if you look at our plan, there's more checkpoints than we had. We might have had three, but in most cases, we have four or more checkpoints. Uh, oh, let me go back to the CIP. I do will say that we do review the CIP four times a year. We just reviewed it again in October. We will review it again in December, right before we go on break. We'll review it again in February, and then again in May before we leave for the summer. Um, so we also looked at PLC and how do we bring that back to our entire team? How does every team learn how to do PLC and how does that work so that everybody is changing not just the outcomes for students but the outcomes for instruction? We wanted to look at not just what students are doing but looking at how are we affecting instruction? Is it effective instruction? How do we know that we're doing a good job? So in the end, what we came up with was the plan that you see here. The things that we've changed this year, among other things, is our change from ISS, or in-school suspension, to OFI, or uh, opportunity for improvement, to present a more positive bent on that as an opportunity for students to be better, not to be punished. Uh, PLCs, using real PLCs, meeting more frequently, and doing much more data reviews than we do, did in the past. One of the things that we've, I want to highlight, two things I want to highlight, number one is on page 11, uh, we brought up, we bring in, uh, in uh, the uh, positive school culture. We realize that school culture is so important to everything that happens, the performance of the, stu the students uh, and the things that they deal with and bring to school every day. And among those things, we uh, included a new initiative that was led by teachers. And we want to give you some, a uh, little fly handout on this. It's called We Are Mac. And uh, one of the things that, I'm, I'm a bit of an existentialist, I love Viktor Frankl, go ahead, Rob. Uh, and uh, I believe that one of the things Viktor Frankl said was that, you know, you can lose just about everything, but the one thing you will not lose, one thing they cannot take away from you is the last of the human freedoms, and that's the decision on how to react to any situation. So this is really an effort to say we are going to not react just to our situation, we're gonna choose our attitude, we're gonna choose our culture, and so this is about bringing back culture to our campus or keeping the culture on our campus where we're incorporating students, teachers, unified in an effort uh, to make not just better, uh, a better environment, but better performance for our students and a better environment for our teachers as well. The other addition that we made this year, our newest addition, is the addition of our MACUP program, which you'll find on the final page 13. This is the first time we've included it. We have our second cohort now. Uh, our first cohort is now attending UTSA and we will have our first graduating cohort next year, our first current students who will graduate and if they choose to continue going on to UTSA as full-fledged students, so.
Mm -hmm. Awesome. So if you have questions about a specific school, we would be happy to get back to you after um, you look through the plans and we can reach out to the principals if you have any questions about any of the specific plans. Um, but at this time, if there are no questions, um, administra administrative staff recommends that the Board of Trustees approve the NEISD Campus Instructional Improvement Plans for the 2019-2020 school year as presented. I am going to ask if anyone has any questions. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? No. I just want to say this is no. Yeah. Pete, this is awesome. This is nice job. Yeah. Okay. So, um, do I have a motion to approve the NEISD campus improvement plans for the 2019-2020 school year as presented? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hosso. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Byer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose the motion carries. Thank you, Susan. You did a really nice job. <laughs> See, we're not scary. We're really nice. Um, item C, business services. One, possible action regarding comprehensive annual financial report, CAFR, for the year ended 20, June 30, 2019. Mr. Villarreal. Uh, yes, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Mike, executive staff and guests. I call on Brian Moy, our executive director of finance and accounting, uh, with Jeff Coates, our senior director of accounting and payroll, to talk about this great information that we're about to present. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Micah, executive staff, and guests. Uh, it's November, which means it's the Jeff Coates show now for uh, the one time we let him out of his office and actually come out. Can we, can we give him five minutes? Uh, I, I, think that's, I think that's the Three? max. Yeah. Three? So uh, just crash. to let you know, uh, you were provided a CAFR uh, <laughs> last week um, with the note that it was a draft and if there were any material changes, we would send you a, a new one. There were no changes. All the numbers stay the same. We did provide you a new copy this afternoon because we found a couple of formatting things, a couple of typos. And just to pull the curtain back a Maybe. little bit, um, Ms. Groner, you found a couple of things. Jeff and I leave some errors in there just to make sure you're reading it. <laughs> okay, game on, man. Okay. This is the first year you've caught a problem. Do, do you remember that I was an auditor by trade? <laughs> I, uh, and I was an auditor for several years. Actually, I worked at a firm with our uh, audit partner from ABIP, Michael Del Toro. And I don't think he would mind me sharing, because he's going to come up and explain what the, they did as an audit firm to look at the financials. But I don't think he would mind me sharing that the definition of an auditor is the person that goes to the battlefield after the fight is over and stabs the wounded. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I audited for seven years. I, I, I could test that that's true. OK, so now. So what's he saying about me? So, so <laughs> let's see. Uh, I signed the paychecks, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you did. Hey, Apparently, not no mine for long. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, I love it. Seriously, <laughs> I I like this. Dan does not approve that message. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So at this time, I want to turn it over to Jeff Coates. He has a very brief presentation uh, and uh, kind of filter you through some of these massive schedules. Good evening, Madam President, board members, Dr. Micah, executive staff, and guests. Did Brian count against my three minutes? Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm here to present the comprehensive, comprehensive annual financial report as mandated by law. Uh, first thing is how to read the CAFR because it is a 250 some plus page document and most of us don't spend a whole lot of time reading it. The main thing is there's a great table of contents. The PDF is, has links to all, each of the individual schedules, so you can click to each schedule that you want to see. It makes it easy to get there. The transmittal letter is a letter from, uh, from the district to the board and constituents explaining what's going on in the district, future challenges, management discussion and analysis, also called MDNA, is a, is a synopsis of what happened during the year and how we got the results we did. And the other thing we want to do in this presentation is review the effects of GASB 68 and 75, which are pension and OPEB related standards that cause a huge impact to our two main schedules in the CAFR. All right, we would like to draw your attention to 
uh, in MDNA, we talk about financial activities. Uh, we highlight financial transactions and highlight the effect of actuarially determined liabilities and activity. Uh, table one and table two show you multi-year comparisons between the, for the district. Mr. Moy separates out the financial activities to our normal activities and then those that are affected by GASB 68 and 75. If you look at this, you'll notice that our net position for the year, the bottom number, would be $294 million if we excluded GASB 68 and 75. And to show you just how much these statements affect us, after the, these things are accounted for, we have a negative $129 million net position based on governmental standards. Uh, these are liabilities that do not reside with us. They're TRS liabilities, but they send us our proportionate share of the liability and the activity, and we have to book those, book those into our financial statements, and that's the effect. Yes, just to remind, especially we have a couple new board members, we are not responsible for paying retired employees' pensions. By law, we make the contributions to TRS that we are required to make, and we are in compliance. Someone nationwide decided that it would be a good idea for every entity that contributes to a multi-employer pension plan to have to show the liability of the pension plan on their books also. So if you were to pick up our CAFR and TRS's CAFR, they're going to show 100% and we're going to show our portion of the percent. So it really, if you look at multiple CAFRs, all the liabilities are doubled. That's why we break this out. And when we say OPEB, that's other post-employee benefits, that's the exact same thing. What is our share of TRS care? But we make all of our contributions to TRS care. We are legally done with our obligation, but we are required to show a portion of TRS's liability on our books. All right, going back to the familiar, uh, we have fun financial statements. There are governmental funds balance sheet, uh, which you'll see on page 26. We also have the governmental funds revenue expenditures and changes of fund balance, which is basically an income statement. That's on page 30. And then we have our three budget actual statements. You see those all year, you approve amendments. We have our general fund budget actual statement, page 33, uh, debt service on page 150, and child nutrition services on page 151. Uh, and you'll see the end of all the end of year adjustments and everything. Looking at the general fund, uh, our final budget, we were showing a net change in fund balance of a negative $12,729,000. Our actual numbers ended up at a positive balance of $5,072,000. So quite the improvement based on not filling vacancies during the year, some POs that rolled, uh, and just good fiduciary management by our budget managers throughout the district. Uh, government accounting requires full accrual government-wide financial statements on page A1 and B1. That's uh, page 23 and 24 in your CAFR. And these statements include transactions for capital assets, long-term debt, TRS pension liability, TRS OPEB liability, and it's a full accrual like you would see in most corporations that you're familiar with. And if you don't have no further questions or any questions, I'll... All right, then we would like to welcome our auditor, audit partner, Michael Del Toro from ABIP. Thank you, Jeff. Brian. Thanks. <laughs> I, uh, I clearly didn't do a good enough job, but Brian's still alive. So. <laughs> Madam President, uh, Dr. Mike, uh, board, executive staff, thank you. I, I am the audit partner on the engagement. Uh, very quickly, uh, I know that we're pressed for time, but we did come in. We, we uh, obviously there's three documents in the audit, uh, the CAFR that belong to us: the independent auditor, auditor's report, which is uh, what you hire us for. Uh, basically, says we did our audit in accordance with uh, auditing standards generally accepted in the United States and government auditing standards, and we find the financial statements as presented to be in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. That's a clean opinion. So. The other uh, two items in there, there's one on the report on internal controls and uh, compliance, and uh, that's towards the back. I'm not, I don't have the, the page numbers in front of me, but it's uh, the, the first uh, uh, item, in, well, third item in the back with our uh, uh, letterhead on there. 
uh, that is a clean opinion as well. We, we're required to look at the internal controls over financial reporting. And if we identify anything in there, we're, we're supposed to communicate that. Now, obviously, giving it a, a designation of whether it's a significant deficiency or material weakness. Through our audit um, procedures and our audit results, we didn't identify any control weaknesses that would be elevated to that level, nor did we have any other comments that we felt necessary to bring to the board. And then the final document in there that belongs to us is the audit, uh, the report on the single audit, the compliance over the uniform guidance. Uh, this year, our major program was Title I. Through our audit procedures, we did not identify any material weaknesses, significant deficiencies, or uh, questionable cost as a result of the procedures that we, so that was a clean opinion as well. With that, I will turn it over to you with any questions on the audit process or what we, we came in and did and the stabbing of the staff as we uh, finish up our work there. Man, you fit right in with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions of Mr. Del Toro? No? Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you that. Very much. Is that it? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> You disappoint me. Well, yes, that's it is it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that is it. Okay. This item. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I get, I get so excited about the CAFR that I just want to go on all night. Brian has to rein me in for my three minutes. Sorry. Okay. So thank you for that. And now we're going to go to item two, possible action regarding public notice of the school first. Uh, excuse me, Madam President. We have to approve the CAFR. Oh, the submission of the CAFR. Really? Come on. I'm ready. Do we have a motion to approve? Page 21. Oh, well, I'm, that's not what it says. All right. Um, a motion that the comprehensive annual financial report for the year ended June 30, 2019, be accepted, signed, and filed as required under law. So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Winkley. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Hosso. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose the motion carries. Now, item two possible action regarding public notice of the school first rating report of superior achievement. Mr. Villarreal. Uh, yes, Madam President. Uh, it's our school first rating. We're superior. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we have to accept oh, it, I'm right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. No, um, I'll turn it over to Jeff. He's got a couple of slides. Sorry. And Just a couple of you're, slides. You're, you're, you're ignoring benefit, he's Brian, not right? To speak anymore, so. he, he's ignoring <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. All right. Schools first is the financial integrity rating system for the state of Texas is basically the accountability for the finest area. There are 15 uh, requirements. One of them was not uh, used this year, so there's only 14, excuse me, 14 listed. As Dan stated, we did achieve superior achievement. <laughs> Statewide comparison, 88.3% of districts throughout the state of Texas also received superior achievement. Not to take the arrow to the balloon. Uh, <laughs> oh. But nice we're gonna be competitive. <laughs> Uh, we did have two low-scoring indicators. Uh, all others, we received the highest rating. Uh, one was current asset to current liability ratio. The other was long-term liability to total asset ratio. Both of them were related to our uh, commercial paper program, where we saved the taxpayers a ton of money on interest payments. But the way the state calculates the ratings, it hurts us in the first rating. Uh, and based on that, are there any questions at this point? Our commercial paper program we, we use in the bond program. So we issue commercial paper to handle our payments for as they come in for contractors and whatnot. Instead of issuing a bond, a bond, a full bond for $100 million or $200 million. So we issue incremental amounts of commercial paper to pay those. And that is at a much lower interest rate. So it saves the district money in interest payments, but it impacts the first rating and that's why we had a 90 this year. Uh, Mr. Moy has found a way to, to make the system work in our favor also and still save the taxpayers money, and I'll let him handle this. But because these are ratios of assets to liabilities, we're not selling $200 million of bonds and having $200 million of cash sitting on the asset side, but we're accumulating liabilities as we're constructing the buildings. We don't go for the debt until after, we, until after the accounts payable has settled those payments so the liabilities get larger without the assets there until it's time to cover 
those payments. So it really messes with those two ratios. And I guess the state hasn't really caught up with trying to change that since we're <laughs> one of the few districts that actually have a commercial paper program. So when they did this analysis for us to calculate, that's not something they're taking into account. So that's why we saved a ton of money on it, the interest side, but you know, it, it dings us a little bit on the uh, first rating. But I mean, it's still superior and it doesn't hurt us tremendously. But it makes sense to do what we're doing. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Um, any questions about this? Well, oh. Jeff, did you, so did you mention that Brian had a, a way around that, or is that just it is what it is? Uh, there is a, a matter of timing for going out to convert the commercial paper from a short-term liability into a long-term liability that helps us, and I'll let him give the details. Yeah, it's so what we're trying to do now is timing our takeout bonds to where um, – it, this will especially help us on the current ratio, the one that we have our lowest uh, rating on. By doing the takeout bonds prior to June 30, then that shifts to long-term debt, not current debt, which a commercial paper is. And so it removes the, the, the current debt so we have a more balanced current ratio. So it'll help that ratio. It won't help the one I think where we scored a six, but it'll help the one where we scored a four. Gotcha. So as long as you have it by period end or year right. end. As long as we've converted it, as long as we've converted commercial paper to long-term debt by then, it'll help this. But then I also have to balance that is if that's what's best for the taxpayer yeah. Right. Yeah. or yeah. debt program. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good point, good point. Okay. Anything else? Okay, do I have a motion? Hang on. Do I have a motion that the TEA School District Financial Integrity Rating of Superior Achievement be noted and the NAISD Annual Management Report on Schools First be accepted? Thank you, Mr. Byer. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Winkley. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose the motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, item D, consent. One, instruction in campus administration, a regional day school program for deaf SSA. Two, business services, a tax roll approval, B, budget amendment number two, C, 50,000 purchases, three, operations, A, professional services contracts, construction contracts, and related contract amendments supporting the 2015 bond design and construction requirements. Four, minutes from July and August 2019, five, end of consent. Do I have a board member wishing to pull an item from consent? Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve consent? So move. Thank you, Mr. Byer. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Winkley. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the motion carries. Item 11 reports A, financial statement review of expenditures that's been provided for you, B, quarterly investment report that's been provided for you, C, awarded bid report that's been provided for you. Item 12 matters from the floor. We had no one sign up. Item 13, discussion and possible action regarding board members' request for items to be placed on a future agenda and or a request for reports from the administration. Does anyone have anything? Seeing none, item 14, adjournment, and the time is 8.06. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.